let's load up this crucible then we'll start the furnace and while that's heating up we have a little bit of time maybe 20 minutes or so we can make the mold while it's heating up and then we'll pour it afterwards that'll save us a little bit of setup time here sand casting is something that i've really fantasized about doing even since i was pretty much a little kid i've always been into metal tools and old machines as soon as I discovered machining in high school, I fell in love with that. And there's always been a piece of me that wanted to be able to make those pieces that you see done in cast iron. So I've been diving down that deep hole the last few months. I kind of wanted to do a quick, well, maybe not so quick, but a video about making a mold at the state of education that I have about it at this time. So we're going to put these two guys in here with the flat bottoms down, which are going to be up when we flip it over. Let's start putting our sand in. Uh, Petrobond sand. That's why I'm wearing the gloves. It does have oil in it, which is not really a problem, except I don't like the, the feeling of it and the way that it sticks to your hands after a while. And the first thing you're going to notice is that I'm not sifting any facing sand on this. And that's mainly because I don't really have any good sand right now for that. Uh, we're in the process of building a mulling machine. And we're just slowly running out of sand, clean sand at this point, usable sand. So what I found works pretty good is that this sand is fine enough by itself that if you sort of tuck in the sand around your pattern as the first thing that you do, then you get a good enough packed down around your pattern that it gives you almost the same effect as having nicely sifted facing sand, at least with this grit of sand. This is kind of fine. This is 140 mesh sand, I believe it is. So we'll just kind of tuck our pattern in as we go around. Once we get up to about halfway full, then we'll go in and pack it. This is just giving structure to the backing sand around the pattern to give it strength so we can move it around and flip it over and take it apart and it's not all going to fall out on us. And then we just keep going with more sand. Give another little tuck into our where our pattern is, make sure we get the detail in there, and then we can pack again. Make sure not to hit your pattern and damage it. And then we'll just finish it off here with another pack. You really do have to overfill it because when you pack it down, it compresses a lot and you'll find yourself having to add sand a bunch of times if you don't overfill it and it's really just a waste of time. So we overfill and then we screed the extra off here. The real target material for these that we're going to be using if we make this a product is going to be cast iron. These are a riser leveling foot for heavy machines. So your machine's leveling foot goes on the top. It gives you a little bit more height off the ground. A lot of the smaller machines are a little too low. It makes it a little bit easier to use the machine because it will get the hand wheels and the knobs and things that you interact with up to where you're ergonomically easier to use. You know, your elbows are not bent too far down. You're not crouching over the machine. And it allows you to get a pallet jack underneath it. We move a lot of machines pretty often. We're doing a lot of different work that changes often. So we're moving machines pretty often. And we've come up with a system where if everything is high enough for us to just put a pallet jack under it, move it where we need to go and set it down, level it and use it there, we're good to go. We move on. No lost time. So this is a design that I did. And once I get good enough at casting and we get a 
furnace setup that's hot enough to do iron, we'll switch over and do these in iron. So the goal is eventually to offer these as a product for sale also. And we can keep working. So here's where we add the second part to our patterns here. And I have to try to get the right one with the right one. These are 3D printed patterns. They are quite consistent, but they're not exactly the same. Even with 3D printing, there's a little bit of fiddling you have to do to get the fits of everything really good. And the better you make it, yeah, the easier it is to make the mold by far. You make a crappy pattern that barely works, you get a mediocre part that you're probably not going to be happy with. We can put the cope on top. Let's add some of our parting powder here. Now we can pack the cope the same way we did the drag. And I'm just going to do my fake sifting here because we don't have facing sand, like I said. And what I've noticed, this uh, cone shape in here is almost like having a core. And you got to really pack it in there decently well in several layers to get it strong enough to not come apart when we uh, take the mold apart. So I'm going to kind of try to sift it nicely around the pattern and then just fill in the backing sand. The backing sand doesn't matter as much. It's just there to hold everything together pretty much and act as the vent for all the hot gas you're going to get in the cavity when you pour the metal in. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to kind of tuck in the pattern. This is a little bit tricky on this side because we have text on the pattern. And I've noticed that sometimes when you tuck it in, you smush the letters a little bit. So we'll see how it comes out I'm doing it this way without some real facing sand. Do our pack. Sometimes if you pack it too tightly, too close to your pattern, it will mess up the details too. Because you're really sliding a lot of sand around there. And if you've got corners on text and stuff like that, then uh, it will sometimes smush those. But you're good on the second layer because you're far enough away. So we'll overfill. Give it a last pack. Hopefully we're over the surface of the flask here. And then we'll screed it off again. You know, I look at a machine, I look at a milling machine, and to me, the pinnacle of the whole world of machining would be, can you make that machine? If you can make that machine, then you can make anything else that you want. But I've always had this fascination with having the ability to make the machine that you can make the things that you want with. And I think part of that is the aesthetic of it. There's an aesthetic design style in cast iron. There's a lot of mechanical engineering that goes into it. If you read about castings and the metal cooling process, you get into chemistry and crystal structure formation and crystal direction. All of that affects the strength of your part. So it's another world you can dive into. It goes as deep as anything else. So the learning curve in the beginning is very steep. But once you build up, you know, a lot of those skills, then you kind of carry them over and uh, you start getting better results. So I've learned with this one, that cone shape that we have upside down right now, if I open this mold the way it is, about 50% of the time those break off. So we're going to flip it over and separate the mold that way. So we use gravity to help hold those cones, that shape inside the pattern together. So the mold is upside down right now and we're just going to lift it apart and we should have two of those cones. Yep. We can go ahead and remove the 
pattern. There's a couple of ways you can do this. You can kind of squish your pattern over a little bit, or a lot of people use a knocker of some kind to sort of separate the sand from the pattern if it's sticking, and it makes it easier to get it out. You're also kind of making the mold in the sand slightly bigger than your pattern so that it will come out easier. Should be pretty good. Here we go. There's the path. And then we want to get this guy out of here without damaging the sand. So that looks good. And then once you get a tiny little bit of wiggle in there, you can lift it out. So if you look in there, you got a nice copy of our pattern. And you see this is going to be a huge defect on our part because the sand stuck to the pattern more than it did itself. It's not a big deal, so I'm just going to leave it for this one. Overall, we're good here, so I'm just going to blow off the little pieces we have here. We had a part that I wanted to make that initially I was going to ask a foundry to pour for us. And I reached out over about a year and a half. I reached out to several different foundries, everything from short run industrial foundries to sculpture and art foundries. What I realized is that nobody wants to do small, short run stuff. The industrial foundries don't want to do it because they probably don't make any money off of it. The sculpture and art people don't want to do it because it's a little out of their realm if it's not an actual piece of art. So it kind of pushed me to the realization that if I want to get these things made and I want to learn how to do it anyway, I might as well do it myself. What I want to do is I want to cut our sprues and our inlets for feeding metal to the cavity. So on this one, I've been going about a half an inch away. We're going to cut all the way through and lift out. We really need three per part on this one to get the shrinkage to not be terrible because it's a thick part. The wall thickness on this is about three quarters of an inch, which is pretty hefty. Here's where we test our cones to see if they break off. Sometimes they will. But we'll put this together carefully. And then we we'll use a little bit more powder through the holes. And that should leave a mark on the drag as far as where we need the sprues. So now we have dots that we can use and I like to use the sprue cutter to go sideways and kind of extrude out a uh, channel for that. So we'll go nice and deep because we want these to be good feeders of hot metal. The first couple of ones that I poured I think that the feeders were too small they cooled off before the part cooled off, and then we didn't have good detail and good finish because it was shrinking too much. And then we do want to round those corners and make sure we don't have any loose sand in the mold. So we'll pack these a little bit so we're not lifting sand into the metal when we pour it in, and then you have metal in your casting, which leaves defects. And if you need to machine it, will quickly destroy your cutting tools. So there's that. Let's tilt it up and make sure we have all of those extra little pieces out of there. So that is done, I think. Let's take a look at this. Probably better to round these off a little bit so there's no sharp corners where sand can break off and flow into our part. So we'll do that. And realistically, we're only going to pour into one of these. 
The rest of them are just going to be risers for extra material to avoid shrinkage. And uh, as far as I know, it doesn't matter which one we pour into. And then we do the outside again, same way, to eliminate any sand falling in. And one of these we're going to want to use for pouring, so it needs to be easy to pour into. Do the same thing, make sure that we're all secure here. And I actually want to cut a pouring trough here. It'll be the first one I've ever done. We'll do it for this, just to see how it goes. Usually I just cut the sprues and I pour right into it. I've been reading and watching a lot about pouring basins. So we're going to try that today. That it goes together this way. Okay. You know, one of the things that I noticed early on is I don't want to spend half an hour on every mold. And once you get going and you're better at it, it doesn't take that long. Trying new things and trying to do multiple pieces, you know, for the first time takes a little bit more time. But once you get going and you have everything set up, it's very reasonable to make a mold and pour this in half an hour. So we're clean inside. We have our whole mold. We've got our pouring basin. I think we're ready to go. One of the drawbacks to these steel flasks is they are extremely heavy and then you go adding sand in them and you can almost barely move them. So I'm going to pour in the middle and see what we get here. It's something that I really want to continue learning about and practicing with and experimenting with. There's products that I'd like to make. There's sculptural artwork stuff that I would like to do. I have occasionally customers that request things that really should be cast that we end up machining because it's not accessible. So this is interesting. If you look at this, the cavity in this is so deep that it burns the sand almost all the way through the uh, flask. And it usually even burns the wood a little bit. These are super hot, but they look pretty good. The mold filled nicely and it filled all the sprues. I don't see a whole lot of shrinkage. It kind of smells like cereal, all that smoke. But once you get the sand off, you can see the, uh, the lettering turned out pretty good. Check that out. <laughs> Probably the best quality so far as far as detail.
all the lettering came out on both pieces. We don't have any shrinkage on the part that I can see. And uh, it's pretty shiny, pretty good. Ready to be cut off ground and put into service. Here we go, our nice hollows on the inside. Yeah, so over here, this scaly, bumpy surface is from the sand that broke off of the cavity and stuck to the pattern. Conveniently, the way that works is if you kind of put a dent or damage in your mold, you can still pour your part and then just grind that off afterwards. But this is my current status of learning sand casting. I'm pretty happy with it so far. The next project, we're going to build a small sand mulling machine. You can see a lot of the black burned sand in here. This stuff here is completely useless. You can break this up and uh, if you try to mold with that, it, it won't stay in place. You'll get all kinds of mold defects. But really you need a mulling machine. You can just throw it all in and it'll recondition it. Maybe you add a little bit of additives, oil or water, whatever you're working with. And then you take it out of the mulling machine. You can put it right in your mold and keep going. So here's an example of the very first ones that I poured. And this is what they're used for. They're riser feet for heavy machine tools. These are aluminum, but this is a light machine. Like I said, we're going to do cast iron for the final iteration of it. But this is a uh, cylindrical grinder that's right in the way of the laser cutter. So if we ever need to move it to load something big, we can just slide a pallet jack under there, pick it up, move it out of the way, and then uh, put it back. And we don't have to lift the machine up with fingers and jacks and cribbing and wood and all those things just to get it high enough to get a pallet jack under it or to get the forklift under it. You just slide it under, pick it up, move it and go.